the aim of this thing called the asset reliability transformation is an attempt to describe what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. Now, I appreciate that everyone listening right now um, comes from different organizations, steel plants, pharmaceutical plants, wastewater districts. I mean, who knows? Uh, oil and gas, you know, and you might say, how can one strategy um, work for everybody? I guess the point is that everyone faces the same challenges regarding senior management support, culture change, getting the foundations right, getting planning and scheduling right, getting condition monitoring right, and a whole lot of other things. It's all about doing it in a structured way, doing what's right for you at the right time, um, building a foundation and and building on it, building on it, building on it, building on it, not jumping in and trying to make one thing work when other key pieces are missing. And so, you know, I, if we had more time, we would be able to spend you know, getting into more details and you would see, yes, it, it will work for anyone because it ensures that you are asking the right questions at the right time and we help you to answer those questions at that time. So anyway, if I keep talking, we'll never get to a Q&A session. So it, it is easy and affordable. That's the little chart, and I'm going to explain more about that in just a moment. The key part is that, okay, we've got this one plan, ART, Asset Reliability Transformation. It's made up of 10 phases. That's those 10 little colorful blocks there. What we've done is we've defined 65 key steps. 65, we've broken up those 10 phases into 65 major chunks. And within those major chunks, we've defined 365 recommended practices. And of course, within those recommended practices, you know, even they will have multiple things that you need to do. Now, potentially, you might be looking at this thinking, oh my goodness, there's so many things we have to do. We have to go through all 365. Well, yeah, unfortunately, the reality has always been that to make reliability successful, there's a number of things you have to do. You know, and, and again, learning from lots of organizations that have had success, you know, building a business case, understanding what is important to your organization, um, making sure people understand their roles and responsibilities, getting people trained. You know, there's all these individual pieces that, that must be in place to make for a good program. And there's 365 of them. Um, and 365 might seem like a, um, a big number, but the only number you really have to think about is one, th the first thing you must do. So you do that. And then all you have to worry about is the second thing you must do. And then the third thing you must do. Now, some of those things you can do kind of in parallel, absolutely. Um, but for me anyway, I felt it was much better to sort of know what the road ahead looked like and know what was necessary and why it was necessary, rather than just being faced with this one thing of, oh, I've got to improve reliability. How on earth do I make it all happen? Anyway, so this little chart, and you can uh, contact us and get any of these graphics. You, I'm sure you can't read any of that, but that's the 65 steps, you know. So in the value phase, these are the major steps in the strategy phase. These are the steps, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we've, def we've defined them all. Now, what I want to do in just this next little while is explain basically what all these little blocks mean, you know, why they exist. Um, and I'm, I genuinely hope you will find it useful. Obviously, we don't have time to go into every single detail. I mean, there's a lot of details. But whatever you plan to do, whether it involves ART or whether it involves whatever, um, there is good reason for all these pieces. So what I want to do is just quickly go through each one of them one by one. So starting from the beginning of your assets life, okay, I'm not starting at the beginning of the ART process. I thought I'd start with 
what you're probably most freak, familiar with and then sort of work backwards. Number one, our goal has to be to ensure that we do not import trouble into the plant. And that is, we have to have a defect elimination mindset. You know, any of the, the selection process we use for the spares we buy, for the new components we use, for the expansions of the plant, for everything, we have to make sure that, you know, we are making choices based on the life cycle costs of the equipment and we have to perform acceptance testing um, so that what comes in the door is is in good condition it's you know it doesn't have hidden bearing faults hidden design problems etc 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 we we have to do that with our vendors who are rewinding our motors or overhauling our gearboxes or whatever it is so that's that's one major thing we have to do so that what comes into the plant gives us the opportunity to run a reliable plant. Now aligned with that, oops, that's right. Um, aligned with that is this attitude of discipline. So everything we do with maintenance and, and the way we operate the equipment, it needs to be standardized. There should be only one way to do things. This idea that this person installs a bearing different to that person and this person aligns a machine different to that person and, and people aren't quite sure there aren't procedures, there aren't standards, there aren't tolerances and, and, and so on. That sort of thing has to end. The only way to really set the machine up for success is to say, okay, we are standardizing what we do you know, with workflows and procedures, proper work management, as in planning and scheduling, proper spares management and materials management, um, management of change and so on. Now, as you'll learn in just a moment, um, we will transition into these things, but I just want to start by saying that the hallmark of a good company that's going to achieve its reliability goals, there will be a disciplined approach to the way we operate the equipment, the way we store our spares, the way we uh, perform our repairs and installations and so on. Once we have the asset, sorry, I went the wrong way. Once we have the assets installed, we have to take care of those assets. You know, loved assets don't fail. We keep them clean, properly lubricated, cool, running smoothly, equipment, you know, calibrated, everything sort of fine tuned so that thanks to the acquire phase and the discipline phase, that equipment is ready to provide good service. And now we're going to take care of it while it is in service. Um, now, I appreciate some of you might come from very dirty uh, you know, environments, you know, steel mill or something like that. But, you know, the uh, dirt and grit and so on, it takes the life out of your equipment. The heat takes the life out of your equipment. So we got to do something about those things. These are all very common root causes. And like I say, there are very simple and straightforward things we can do to achieve all of these things I'm talking about. The next thing is the analytics phase. That is all about making data-driven decisions. So condition monitoring is part of the analytics phase. It's all about taking measurements and making decisions re regarding the way we operate the equipment and maintain the equipment based on the data we've collected. But we can, we can learn from the way the equipment's performing. Um, we can look at the OEE. We, we also need to look at how the, you know, the, the pressures on the business. Now, I'll come back to this when we talk about the value phase, and I need to sort of hurry along because we're running out of time. But everything you do needs to be aligned with the goals of the business. But from time to time, those goals can change. Hey, you have a pandemic, it changes. You have a global economic crisis, it changes. The nature of the competition changes. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors. We need to use data-driven uh, decisions. Um, and as part of that, we need to learn from the failures, the near misses, the uh, poor performance and so on. So it's kind of like an extension of it, but certainly when equipment fails, we've got to say, why did that happen um, and how can we avoid it happening again? And last but not least for this top group, we have to always optimise and improve, continuously improve everything we do. You know, in the discipline phase, I mentioned this idea that um, 
uh, we have to do everything one way. It should be the best way to do things and everyone does it that one way until thanks to the optimized phase, we find a better way of, of doing things and we then do it that way. Okay, so this is all great. And you know, if, if you are already somewhat experienced with reliability, you might say, yeah, okay, this, this is all fine. I've heard this sort of stuff before. Um, now, just, just briefly, we call that the cycle of reliability. Set it up with discipline, take care of it, um, learn from its performance to see what needs to be done and continually optimize. And the, the equipment should stay in this loop. It's just running happy, 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 happy. You know, that's the, the equipment, um, you know, running. If we stay in that cycle of reliability, we'll be good. Um, from an asset life cycle point of view, um, you know, the asset sort of comes in through the acquire phase, enters our cycle of reliability, and then eventually leaves via the, oh, EOL, by the way, is end of life. Sorry, I didn't mention that. Um, okay, so, sorry, I got my animations mucked up. Now, you may be wondering, okay, that's all fine, but how do you make all that happen? So, now this is the foundation, and I would argue that these are the steps that I'm about to go through are the steps that most people skip over. They try to jump into the cycle of reliability. They think, okay, we will go from zero to hero. We will try and do all these things that I talked about in, in this sort of cycle of reliability. And that's where most programs fall over. It's just too hard to, to do that. So number one is the value phase. Everything we do must generate value. You must be able to sell that case to the business leaders. You must be able to go to them and say, not reliability is really good and it'll make the plant safe. You need to say, um, this is the business case. This is how economically this will all work. And if you keep reminding them of the business case forevermore, they will stand behind it because they will see how much sense it makes. The second phase is strategy. And that's just having, you know, a, a path to success. Um, forming a team, gaming, gaining support, there's, there's a, a, a lot to this, but I've, I'm running out of time here. Um, but you must have a strategy. Now, what we're laying out here provides you a strategy, but you then need to take it and say, okay, well, for us, this is what we're going to do. This is how we are going to do it. These are the people who will be involved in the process and so on. The people phase is tremendously important because reliability can't be solved by the reliability department. Everyone must contribute from the engineers to the procurement department to the maintenance people, the operators, production people, and so on and so forth. We need company-wide buy-in. When we get senior management support through the value phase, that enables us to, to change the culture. We want motivated people, engaged people, and competent people with the right skills and, uh, and knowledge and certification and so on. But everyone needs to get involved. There's so much more I could say about all this, but we're really running out of time. Um, now, if we have senior management support and a plan, and as part of that strategy, by the way, is you know your asset strategy for how the maintenance is going to be done and, and all of that. And we've got people on board, we can be successful. But just doing those things sets us up for success, but we must overcome the major barrier, which I like to call the reactive maintenance cycle of doom. And so consider this control phase, getting maintenance under control as a um, as a transition phase. This is doing some of all these things. It's kind of like putting the trainer wheels on, if that's a phrase you use. Um, you know, just getting started, doing the basic planning and scheduling, doing the basic asset care and, and so on and so forth. So this is the idea that we set sort of the foundation through the value strategy and people phase. We sort of learn to crawl, then walk through the control phase. We, we're getting reactive maintenance under control. We're getting some of the fundamentals in place so we can be successful. And then we can go further with it all by 
you know, looking at the discipline, care, optimize, you know, acquire and uh, end of life phases. So that's the, you know, the idea of this process.